Well, good morning and welcome to Scott's Hill. Those of you who are watching us online, we're so glad that you're able to join us. Those of you who are going to watch us during the course of the week, maybe at another time, thank you for joining us at this moment. My name is Phil Ortigo. I serve as a senior pastor here at Scott's Hill, and it's so good for me to be back on the platform, back to be able to preaching. I've been off for the last month. It's really funny because I haven't preached the last month. I've been here the last two weeks. People are like, are you on a sabbatical? I said, preaching's not the only thing I do, okay? I do do other things other than preach, I think. And so when they let me, but it's good to be back here. My wife and I had the opportunity to be gone. We went to the beautiful country of Ireland and we got to tour all around Ireland. We began in, in Dublin. We went up to Belfast, went up north to Londonderry, made our, our way all the way around. And as we're going around, we end up at the, at, at the Bar- Blarney Castle. And of all the people we can run into at the Blarney Castle, we run into this young couple, Garrett <laughs> and Kaylee Burns, who are on staff here at Scotts Hill. So we're running, we ran into them, and I challenged, I challenged Garrett to kiss the Blarney Stone because I went before him. And all these people are listening, so he had no choice but to kiss the Blarney Stone. Did you kiss it? He kissed it. I just want you to know, I want to confess openly, I actually didn't kiss it. I wasn't putting my lips on that filthy stone. What's wrong with you, man? But we had a great time together as we toured around um, all of Ireland. And while we were there, we met some wonderful folks. We were on this coach tour with 42 other people. And so we got to know each other after 10 days. And I want to give a shout out to some of the ladies that Chris and I met there. They're from New Jersey. They're two sets of sisters and there's a cousin and they're all watching this morning from New Jersey. And so I want to give a shout out to June and Carol, the two sisters. And well, hold up, hold up just a minute. Let me give them all the names. June and Carol, the two sisters. Then you've got Sandy, Debbie, and Donna. And then you've got Nancy and they're all from New Jersey. I want to count of three. I want y'all to say hi, y'all. One, two, three. So good to have you guys. And there were people from all over the place. By the fourth day, I knew everybody's name. And Chris was like, what are you, trying to win Mr. Congeniality? (laughs) Um, But I just enjoy getting to know people, and it was a wonderful time. And so it's so good to be back here in the United States and to be back here at Scotts Hill with our faith family. Um, Let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried to tell somebody something important but they never believed you. Anybody? You try to tell somebody, no matter what you do to try to convince them of something you want to say, you cannot make them believe you. Several years ago, this happened to me. Um, I am not really good at picking out gifts for my wife. I'm really not. Anything I ever buy her, she returns. And, And it's not because she's hard to please. It's just that I'm not very good at paying attention to clues. And I just confess that. I'm not. So Christmas is several years ago. I decided to go with Chris, and I thought I'd do this. I'll offer to go shopping with her, and I'm going to pay close attention. This was my plan. I'm going to watch everything she picks up, everything she shows, any kind of interest in. I'm going to come back and get that thing. And so she's not going to even know it. So we're out shopping, and she immediately picks up. She says, you're here to figure out what I want so you can come back. I said, what gave it away? She said, the fact that you offered to come shopping with me. I said, okay, I can't win. Let's make a deal. You pick them out. I come back and buy them. I wrap them up, put them on the tree. And Christmas morning, you open it. You act surprised and say, that's just what I wanted. And I sit over there and say, nailed it. (laughs) And it's been perfect ever since then. So we went to this place and she picked out some jewelry. And that's what she wanted. And so Leslie and I went back a couple of days later. We picked up the jewelry. They put it in a box, and we went to the counter to pay for it. And as I'm standing at the counter, behind the counter, is this really joyful African-American lady. She's just filled with joy. She's got the spirit of Christmas, and she's just smiling. And she just kept smiling at me and just kept smiling at me. And finally, she leaned over, and she said, you that man on TV, aren't you? I said, pardon me? She said, you're that man on TV. And I'm thinking maybe she saw us online. I said, well, I'm online. No, 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 no. You're that that, that movie star. (laughs) And I said, ma'am, I don't know what you're talking about. And Leslie looks at me like, what's going on? She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw you in the movies. You're that man. You just don't want anybody to know you're here. I get it. (laughs) 
And I said, my curiosity, I said, well, ma'am, what movie are you talking about? She said, you know that man that's in that movie with that pretty woman? I'm thinking, she thinks I'm Richard Gere. Unless she's just not, I said, no, ma'am, I am not. Yes, you are, yes, you are. I, I got you, I know who you are. She winks at me. Leslie and I walk us out, we go walk out and she says, Leslie says, dad, who's she talking about? I said, she was talking about a man by the name of Richard Gere, but I was a little put off. And Leslie said, why are you put off? I said, because I really thought she thought I was Tom Cruise. <laughs> and for those of you who are listening by audio and can't see me, she was right. She would have been right. So, so anyway, our story, we've been in a series dealing with who's that. We've been looking at all of these biblical characters from the Old Testament and the New Testament that don't necessarily show up in the Bible stories of your kids. They're not necessarily messages that you hear on Sunday morning. These are the obscure characters that the Holy Spirit has recorded for us because there are truths that we can learn from them. This morning, our character is someone who had something very, very important to say to the church but they would not believe her. And no matter how much she insisted, they would not believe what she was telling them was true. This morning, we're looking at a character from the book of Acts chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, turn to Acts chapter 12. And in Acts chapter 12, we discover this little known Bible character. There are over 31,000 verses in the Bible. And of the 31,000 verses, her name appears once. And her actions appear in two verses after that. In Acts chapter 12, we find the name of a little girl named Rhoda. Now, let me ask you honestly. How many of you in this building or watching online ever heard of Rhoda? If you really heard of Rhoda, raise your hand. How many of you in this room and watching online, when I said Rhoda, this came to mind? (laughs) How many of you? How many of you? Yep. Y'all are old. I just want to tell you. (laughs) Valerie Harper. So we're going to look at the story of a little girl named Rhoda. Her story is told in Acts chapter 12. We get to it in about verse 14. But we have to set the context straight before we get to Rhoda. So what we're going to do, we're going to go through verses 1 through 11 before we start dealing with Rhoda, because you have to understand the context. And so setting the context for you helps you to understand how significant Rhoda is and how blessed we are going to be today to learn three important things about her. Now, let me just say this. As we unpack the first 11 verses, this sermon on the front end is going to be pointless (laughs) in the sense that I don't have any points. But then we're going to look at the points on the end and tying it all together. And as we go through it, there are going to be little side notes that I'm going to make along the way. But we're going to spend the first 15 minutes or so dealing with the context. Then when we get to Rhoda, you're going to be blown away. Okay? So here's the setting. The church in Jerusalem is exploding in growth. When we get to the book of Acts, the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit's record to the world of how the church grew through the ages. And we see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to his disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And the entire book of Acts is about that becoming a reality. By the time we get to Acts chapter 12... The church has exploded in growth. There's a tens of thousands of new believers. People are abandoning Judaism. They're abandoning the legalistic teachings of the religious leaders, and they are embracing following Christ. Lives are being transformed. Priests are coming to faith in Christ. It is like this incredible utopia, but persecution has broken out as well, and the church is beginning to be persecuted and spread. By Acts chapter 12, the religious leaders are putting pressure on King Herod. And they're saying, you've got to do something. You've got to stop this movement of Christianity that's going around the world. We're losing our power and our prestige in this area. So as everything is growing, we're in in the Passover celebration. 
And in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, here's what happens. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He began to arrest them and persecute them and kill them. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. James and John, the sons of thunder, two of the original disciples, he kills James. And when he kills James, he finds out his popularity among the Jews is beginning to skyrocket. So what does he do next? And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. He thought, listen, if they're happy because I killed James, they're going to really be happy if I put to death the leader of this entire movement. So he arrests Peter thinking that I'm going to put this guy to death. It's going to be the end of Christianity and I'm going to be the popular king once again. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison. Not only did he put Peter in prison, but notice what he does. He delivers him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Four squads of soldiers. Commentators have different opinions on what a squad of soldiers are. Some say it's two. Some say as many as it's four. So Peter, an uneducated, unimportant fisherman, is being guarded anywhere from eight soldiers to 16 soldiers. Why? Because they know supernatural things have been happening in his life. And with Christianity and the, the, and the rising of Jesus from the dead, Herod's doing everything he can to stop Peter from escaping. And he's intending after Passover to bring him out to the people. He didn't want to kill him during the Passover. But when Passover's over, he's going to bring Peter out. Now, while Peter's in prison, what is the church doing? Here it is. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. The church is praying. Now, we're not talking about the church like what's gathered here. They had no buildings to gather in. They were meeting in homes. There were tens of thousands of Christians in and around Jerusalem. In all the homes in the vicinity, there was a prayer meeting going on. Earnest prayer. Not just a mention of Peter, but a constant praying. They're praying all night. They're praying these long, protracted prayers. They're agonizing over the situation that Peter finds himself in. And what are they doing? They're praying that Peter would be released from prison. You know what I love about this? Is that there are a lot of people here today who are in their own prisons. There are a lot of people here today who have some strongholds in their lives. There are people who are listening online. You know what I'm talking about. You've got relatives who are struggling with all kinds of difficulties. You know what we have the tendency to do as a church? You know what we have the tendency to do as people? We look at them and say, man, they just need to get their act together. Man, they just need to have a little discipline in their life. Man, if they can just do this, or they can follow this program, or I can change this behavior. And let me tell you, the greatest thing they need, they need for the people of God to be on their knees, earnestly praying for their deliverance from their prisons. I wonder how many people in this room today are one prayer away from being freed. I wonder how many people that you work with are one prayer away from being set free and delivered. And more times than not, you know what we end up doing? We think that prayer is the last line of defense. It is the first act of offense. And I'm so glad that I had somebody in high school praying for me. There was this kid by the name of Terry Mitten. I thought he was a little odd. He'd always write in my notebooks, I love Jesus, it's better than all these things. And one day he looked at me and said, Phil, I want you to know, I've committed my senior year to pray for you every day. I'm like, thanks, freak. You know, and... Um, by the end of my senior year, I met Jesus Christ and God transformed my life. Now, why am I saying that? Because there are people in your life that are in prisons. And the answer is not necessarily a drug. The answer is not necessarily a psychiatrist. The greatest answer is prayer. And you can pray for people who are in prison. Let's look at verse 6. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out that very evening, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and centuries before the door were guarding the prison. I love this. That next morning, Peter is being executed. 
The next morning, Herod is going to bring him out before the people and he's going to publicly execute him. And here's the thing that blows my mind. Here's Peter waiting for execution and what is he doing? He's sleeping. Chained between two guards. Can you imagine how difficult that would be to sleep chained with some? Okay, on three, everybody roll left. You can't, I mean, can you imagine that? The point was not to be able to sleep. Listen, we're going to chain you up. We're going to keep you awake all night. You've got this, this death on your head tomorrow. You are being put to death. And what is he doing? He's sleeping like a baby. I mean, he is out. He is way better than anything that Ambien can give you. I mean, he's gone. And I'm like, how can he do that? Well, he could do it because he was at perfect peace with Jesus. He was at perfect peace with what God wants to do in his life. He knew Herod really couldn't do anything to him. If Herod even took his life, great, he'll be in the presence of Jesus forever. And I wonder sometimes what's keeping you awake? What's keeping me awake at night? Why can't we sleep? You know, I love what Peter would say later in one of his epistles. He says, cast your cares on him because he what? Cares for you. So Peter is sound asleep. How asleep is he? Look at verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. All of a sudden, this angel just appears. An angel comes to fetch Peter out of prison. And he struck Peter on his side and woke him up. Listen, Peter is in such deep sleep that the light shines around him. He didn't wake up. When it says the angel struck him, it doesn't mean he just tapped him. He probably kicked him. Peter, come on, man, get up. Woke up, he said, get up quickly. And the chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself, put on your sandals. And he did so, wouldn't you? (laughs) And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Here's what I love about this. Nobody came to deliver Peter from a human standpoint. Peter didn't overcome the guards on his own. The disciples didn't storm the prison and set him free. A group of people didn't try to uh, um, come up with some kind of plot. Peter had no control over his circumstances. It was God's grace. It was God's sovereignty. It was God's work that set Peter free. Let me tell you what I thought about that. How many times do I try to work myself out of difficult situations? And I do it in my own flesh. How many times do I as a pastor try to help other people get out of their situations? I I, I tell people all the time, if there's a ministry of slapping stupidness out of people, I would want that ministry. (laughs) Because I see it all the time. And how many people try to work themselves out of their own strongholds? I'm telling you this morning, you cannot do it. It takes a supernatural work from Almighty God. And the problem is if we run to the things of the world to always try to deliver us from our problems, we will never be delivered. It's only in running to Jesus. And says we can run to him and he does the work and the chains fall off and the freedom comes. Some of you here this morning, you're struggling to try to get yourself out of a mess that only Jesus can get you out of. And this morning he is standing beside you, maybe even kicking you and saying, wake up. I'm the only one that can help you with this. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, He said, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and all that the Jewish people were expecting. He came to himself. He realized this isn't a vision. This is real. An angel of the Lord has come and has delivered me. And not only has he delivered me from my difficulty, he delivered me from what everybody else is expecting to happen. What were the Jews expecting? They were expecting a public execution. They were expecting the end of Peter. They were expecting the death of a dream. They were expecting the crucifixion of Christianity in its crib. They were expecting to end all of this. You know what I love? What I love about when God works in his people, that when God is doing a great work in us and we're walking with him, he disappoints the things that the world expects worse of us. And there might be people in your life right now that are expecting you to fail. There might be people in the world who are expecting for the church to crumble under the pressure of this godless culture. But I love that when we keep in step with the Spirit and we follow his word, that the expectations of the world are constantly destroyed 
because of Jesus in us. My very first ministry was in a small country church and I preached my first sermon and a lady came afterwards and compared me to Billy Graham. She did. She said, I'm sure when he started, he wasn't good either. (laughs) And when I came here, there were a lot of expectations that I wouldn't last. I'm going in my 29th year at Scotts Hill, and it's not because of anything I've done. It's because of God's grace working in and around us. So you know what? Live your life in such a way that the world is disappointed by what God is doing in you. So what happens in verse 12? Love it. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. He's kind of like all of a sudden the angel disappears. He's gone, boom, he's left in the street. You know, he comes to himself. He's like, okay, this isn't a vision. Where does he go? He goes to the one place he knows where he's gonna be safe. He goes to Mary's house. Mary is the mother of John Mark. John Mark was a young man who often hung out with the disciples. John Mark ultimately went on mission trips with Paul and Barnabas. John Mark was rejected by Paul, and Paul and Barnabas got in a fight over John Mark. Paul refused to take John Mark because he left a mission, and he took Silas with him. Barnabas, his cousin, took him with him and went on a mission trip. And John Mark ultimately becomes best friends with Peter, and we have the gospel of Mark today because of John Mark. But Peter goes to this place, and when he goes there, what are the people doing? They're praying. Now the scene shifts. The church has been praying. Peter's in prison. The church is still praying. Peter's in the street, free. Here's the point. Many times... While we are in the midst of our prayers, God is doing some miraculous stuff that we never see. We don't see it. We're praying through it. We're wondering if God is answering. And behind the scenes, God in his providence and his sovereignty is working out all these things. Peter's in the street and they don't even know he's free. And yet they're continuing to pray. And some of you have been calling out to God for things for a long time. And in your sense and in your mind, you're thinking he is not listening. But behind the scenes, he is working. Some of you have been praying for a marriage for a long time. And you don't see any fruit out of that. And you're wondering what God is doing. Some of you have gone through the brokenness of a failed marriage and you wonder how is God going to take this and you're calling out to him and he's working behind the scenes and he's saying, listen, you just have no idea what I'm about to do. Some of you are praying for children who have drifted away and you're ready to give up because you see no change and God is behind the scene doing a work. Some of you, you think your dream has died. And God is still working. He's saying, don't quit praying because the reality is you can't really see what he's doing beyond that. Keep praying. And so they're praying. Now we come to Rhoda. There's the context. The church is praying. They're in the house. They're in Mary's house. Peter's outside in the street. And where does he go? He goes to the house of Mary. And when he comes to the door, he knocked at the door of the gateway. In these very nice homes that were in these areas, they had an external gateway before you got to the internal door. So Peter is knocking at the gateway. A servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. There she is, Rhoda. First time we see her in scripture, the only time we see her name, Her name means rose, rose, a rose petal. It's a reflection of very sweet character and sweet disposition. She is a young girl. Scholars believe she's anywhere from 10 to 12 years old, very young. And she's not just a servant girl because a 10 to 12 year old girl would not possibly be able to hire herself out as a servant. She is a slave girl of the house of Mary, which means that Mary was well off because she could afford slaves and servants. And this is the picture of Rhoda. But more than that, listen, she's in the prayer meeting. She is praying, which means that she is a follower of Jesus Christ 
She is a child of God, and she is a participant of the church of Christ. And she is with the church praying, calling out for Peter's delivery. And what does she do? She goes to the door. Let me give you two things. Number one, God delights in revealing his power to the most unsuspecting people. I love this. What we see in Rhoda is that God delights in revealing his power to the most unsuspecting of people. This was a very significant home. Mary is there. John Mark is there. Most likely other disciples are there. Peter is going to that house. Why? Because probably the prominent leaders of the church are all gathering there. They're all in the other room. They're all praying. Who is the first person to see the miracle that God is going to do? A 10 to 12-year-old slave girl who is the most unsuspecting of the entire group. She's the most uneducated. She's the most insignificant. And yet God chooses to reveal his power to her among all, in front of all the others. Go through the pages of scripture and you'll find that always to be true. Mary, a young peasant girl in a dead-end town called Nazareth has a visitation from an angel called Gabriel who says the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will conceive and give birth to the Son of God, the most unsuspecting in that village. Joseph, a poor carpenter who can barely make ends meet. Gabriel appears to him in a dream and says, you will be the stepfather raising the Son of God in your home. The shepherds, the first ones to see God in the flesh, unsuspecting, uneducated, unloved community. And they were the first ones to see the birth of Christ. The disciples, a ragtag band of uneducated, uncouth fishermen would turn the world upside down. Mary Magdalene, a woman who was delivered from demons because of a godless lifestyle, a woman in a man's world that would never carry the testimony in a court of law is the first one to see the risen Savior and to report that Jesus is alive. Here's what we learn from this. A lot of times we think that the people who have the most power or the most knowledge or the greatest positions or the pastors or the leaders or the ones who get to see the great power of God at work and many times it's the most unsuspecting. There's a young man in our church who started coming to a student ministry who, who fell in love with Jesus, who came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. His burden was for his family. He started inviting them to this church. And as a result, his dad gets saved. His sister gets saved. Their marriage is reconciled. And we have seen incredible transformation. And that little seventh grade boy got to see the power of God. Don't limit yourself because of your failures or your past or your insignificance. What we find from Rhoda is that God loves to reveal himself to those that the world would consider insignificant. The apostle Paul writes this. He says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Why? Because when God uses weak people, he gets all the glory. So the first thing we see is God often reveals his power to the most unsuspecting people. But here's the second thing we see about Rhoda. God delights in the most common acts of obedience. He delights in the most common acts of obedience. What I mean by that? Rhoda's job was to answer the door. Now she's in a prayer meeting with everyone else. She could say that the most significant thing for me to do is stay in prayer. Everybody's pleading for Peter. Somebody's knocking at the door. Rhoda, go get the door. She gets up and she goes answers. Now, what she could have said is, no, 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 no. I can't answer the door. We're too important right now in our prayer efforts. I can't give up my prayer discipline for manual duty. She gets up and she goes to the door. Here's the thing. 
If she wouldn't have performed a simple act of obedience, then Peter would still be knocking at the front door and ultimately soldiers would have arrested him because by now they were looking for him. And she just gets up and the simple act of obedience fulfills what God wants to do in her life. Let me say two things. Number one, sometimes we sacrifice Christian duty because we're so absorbed in our Christian discipline. Sometimes we sacrifice Christian duty because we're so concerned about our Christian discipline. I can't go do that. I'm having a Bible study. Oh, I can't minister to my neighbors right now. I'm too deep in memorizing scripture. Well, you know, I I can't really help the homeless right now because I've got to do things in the church. And sometimes what we do is get so absorbed in our Christian disciplines that we don't even live out the simple duties that God calls for us. Listen, yes, study the Bible, but live it at work. Yes, have your convictions, but put feet to your convictions that benefits other people. Yes, let's stand and applaud and celebrate that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. But let's participate in loving those single ladies who are choosing to keep those children. Let's participate in ministering to those women who have chosen abortion but are now dealing with the ramifications of emotional scars. We cannot just say, yes, celebrate this without participating. Our disciplines should never interfere with our duty. In fact, our disciplines should fuel our duty. And so Rhoda gets up. If she never would have got up, it would have been no help. Here's the second thing. A lot of times we think all the big things that we can do for God are the most significant. Oh God, I want to do these big things for you. I want to do all of these great accomplishments for your name. And God is saying, great, start with the little ones. Because it's a thousand little obedient steps that bless the heart of God. Because many times we think it's these super grandiose things that we have to accomplish where God will applaud us. And the Father is saying, no, no, no. Do what you know to do today, right now. Answer the door. Here's what I love about great commentators of the past and great preachers. Alexander McLaren said this, the smallest, commonest acts of daily life are truer worship than is the rapt and solitary communion or united prayer. If the latter can only be secured by the neglect of the former, the greater things begin with the little ones. And if we're not gonna release those great disciplines, or we're not gonna combine the great disciplines with the duties, we're missing We're missing. Little common acts. The lady that goes to the nursing home and loves on women who have no family and no one will ever see what she does, it will never be recorded, but those little common acts of love bring transformation. Those of you who are working in our nurseries on a regular basis and you're picking up little kids and you're changing diapers and you're rolling on the floor with them and you're loving them, those common acts of love. Those of you who are working with the homeless, those of you who are working at Lifeline Pregnancy Center, those of you who are doing the little things of living by the fruit of the Spirit every single day, it's making a difference. This past week, we had a couple of girls in our neighborhood. I'm going to name them. Ruby and Sophia, they put together, and these are little entrepreneurs. They are always doing some kind of little work. And they came out and passed out handwritten flyers to all the neighbors saying that they're going to have a lemonade stand and a bake sale. And so they gave us these little flyers, and we're looking, and we said, listen, we're probably not going to be here, but if we can, we'll make it there because we've got obligations that morning. So we got back early. Chris ran down there, and she gave them $7. I said, how much was it? She said, it was only $2, and I gave them $7. I said, well, that's a great tip. Did they give you any extra? She said, no. I thought, wow, great. You know, they're they're learning how to make a profit, I guess. (laughs) But she said, but look what they did. And they put them in a little bag, 
for the neighbors. And they rolled the bag up. And here's the scripture verse they put on the bag. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. They're evangelizing the neighborhood. And might be getting wealthy at it as well. (laughs) The little things. What happens next is comical. I got to hurry. Recognizing Peter's voice, which means she's heard him before, right? 12, 14, okay. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she didn't open the gate, but ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. Peter's banging on the door. It's Peter, it's Peter. Boom, she runs in the other room. Peter's left there and saying, hello? And Rhoda's gone. She's so excited that God's prayer is answered. So what does she do? Look at verse 15. She said to, they said to her, she goes in there and she says, guys, 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 stop praying, stop praying. Peter's at the door. Peter, Rhoda, don't interrupt us. We're praying for his delivery. He's at the door. What did they say? You're out of your mind. It's crazy. Here they are praying for his release. She says he's free. And they said, you're crazy, girl. God doesn't act like that. How many times have you had prayers that you've prayed and you never, ever expected God to answer them? If we be honest, most of us. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. Now, that is a really weird phrase. It is his angel. Here's what it means. They had a belief in that day that every single person had a guardian angel. And at times of crisis or times of death, the guardian angel would take the human form of the individual that he was guarding and that human form would appear before people. And so this guardian angel is really there. And basically what they're saying is this, he's dead. They would rather believe some crazy theology than to believe that God delivered Peter. Here's what they forgot. Now, while the angel fetched Peter out of prison, their prayers fetched the angel out of heaven. And they wouldn't even admit it. And she kept insisting. The only one who believed it was a 10 to 12-year-old girl. Here's the last point. God delights in those who believe him. God delights in those who believe him. She kept insistent insisting that he is delivered. And I love this about her because she wouldn't give up. She's saying, listen, you could tell me everything. You can call me crazy. I know what I saw. You could call me out of my mind. I know what I heard. You can say that he's dead. I know what God has done and you cannot convince me otherwise. I believe God. Now, let me tell you, there's a world of difference between believing in God and believing God. Because everyone in this room today would probably say, I believe in God. But it's when you believe God that things change. It's when you believe God and his passion and his purpose and his ability that things change. She believed God. I want to tell you, we're living in a culture today where people are saying you're out of your mind for believing all that stuff. A young person gets saved and they go and start telling people about Jesus and the culture says, you're crazy, you're out of your mind. Don't you know that God is dead? Don't let anybody talk you out of what God has given to you. And some of you have dreams and visions that you're trusting God for and other people have said, that can't ever happen. Keep trusting him and let them be disappointed in their expectations of what can happen. So how does it end? It's crazy. He, Peter's still knocking. They're in there arguing about whether he's dead or not. He's knocking at the door. He's hammering away. And they finally decide to go to the door. And they opened and they saw him and they were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James. James is the half-brother of Jesus, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And to the brothers. These are all the other brothers and sisters who were at other churches praying. Go back and tell everyone. Then Peter departed and he went to another place. Interesting, this is the last time we see Peter in the book of Acts. 
in any significant form. From this point on, it's Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas. Why? He went back to work. So how do we wrap this up? Let me just tell you just a couple of things. Believers, today, what God wants us to know through the life of Rhoda is that like Rhoda, you and I, in and of ourselves, are slaves to sin. We're slaves. And it's only a work of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can set us free. And being free... He desires for us to understand and see his power at work in our lives as we walk obediently doing the little things every single day to please and to honor him and to believe him with our lives. Very simple. Isn't it interesting how complicated we make it? And yet this 10-year-old girl, in the simplicity of her devotion was able to model those things for us. So as you go here, believe God. Stand on the convictions of his word. Develop the disciplines of your life, but walk in the duty of day-to-day obedience in the little things that will bless his heart. If you're here today and you're not a believer, this is really important. There is someone this morning knocking at the door. There's someone this morning who is more persistent and more patient in his knocking than Peter ever was, and it's the Lord Jesus. And he's knocking at the door of your life, and he's inviting you to open the door. What will you do? What will you do? Will you try to fix the problems on your own? Or the only one who can fix the problems of your life is there right now, saying, come to me. I'm the only one who can forgive you of your sin. Come to me, I'm the only one who can give you a relationship with God. Come to me in all of your efforts and all of your doing and all of the try to removal of the chains of your life, you will never do it. I have the key, you don't. Come to me. And trust me and watch me do something amazing. Tomorrow is July 4th where we celebrate liberty. But in Jesus Christ, every day is a celebration of liberty and freedom. Let's live freely. Let's learn from this little 10-year-old girl of how to walk in such a way of simplicity and obedience to bless the heart of Almighty God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our time together. I thank you for this little story that has such deep meaning. And Father, as we walk through all of these things, I pray that your Holy Spirit today would take what was said and those pieces that have pierced the heart of Those of us in this room, Father, you would take those, burn them deep within our hearts and our minds, convict our lives, and change us for your glory. I ask, Father, that as we scatter from this place, that you would use us as the aroma of Jesus in the world, that the discipline that we learned is fleshed out in the duty of our obedience. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.